As a systems uh, immunologist, uh, my goal is really to understand, uh, a more, have a more complete picture of the immune system. And one of the ways we do that, as we heard many times uh, today, is to link genetic variants uh, with traits or diseases uh, across uh, uh, human uh, subjects. Now, this uh, is working very well, and uh, many of the talks we heard are about collecting data so that we can do that. But as you can see, there's quite a long path between the genetic variant and the trait, even though you've linked them. And so what we're interested in is actually that middle part, that black box, and asking how we can use big data to break into that black box and uh, really understand the, the networks, the molecular and cellular networks that link the genetic variants to the trait or the disease. So what I'll tell you about today is two stories. One, uh, really the main thing we'll talk about, is, uh, is doing this for tumor immunity. Uh, and the second one, <coughs> which I'll just mention really as a vision, is how we're analyzing the innate immune response um, to try to get to really a, a much, much deeper uh, view that ultimately would lead to a set of equations like uh, Michael Levitt uh, described, um, but not at the atomic level, but rather at the gene level. So uh, the first uh, question in tumor immunity is a pretty simple one to describe, which is a person comes into the clinic, and if you look in their tumor, you'll find that there's a large variation in the immune uh, infiltrate across individuals. And one of the questions we asked is, how uh, is that controlled? Can we explain that variation uh, from a genetic point of view? And we'd like to find, in particular, the drivers of those immune responses and the resistors. So we went to the TCGA uh, data set, uh, over uh, 10,000 uh, tumors that had been sequenced and uh, RNA-seqed and so forth, and asked could we use those uh, to start to analyze the immune response. Now, because the way TCJ was done is they took whole biopsies of tumors and profiled them, uh, the immune system was in there. And so the question is, could we extract information about the immune system, then use that to do a genetic study? We decided to focus on cytotoxic T cells because they are able to uh, detect tumors uh, by, <clears throat> by uh, detecting uh, antigens that are presented on the surface of tumors, and then to kill those tumors or virus-infected cells or bacterial-infected cells by releasing uh, a protein called perforin, which puts a hole in the target cell, and then a granzyme, an enzyme, that then cuts uh, the proteins inside the cell and kills it. And this is something that you'd really want to have in your tumor. As you can see on the right, uh, this is uh, published studies that have shown a, a good prognosis with increased a number of cytotoxic T cells in your tumor. So this is something that uh, we want to have. So we'd like to know what, why do some people have more of them, why do some people have less, and can we use that information to actually design uh, new therapeutics? Uh, of course, the immune system is more complex than just the T cells, but for this uh, study, we focused entirely on those T cells. And we first had to develop a metric that we can use to measure uh, those cytolytic T cells. We call it CYT. And it's a combination signature that includes uh, the granzyme and perforin genes, those two that I just mentioned before, that poke the hole and kill the target cell. So we use that as a signature to essentially uh, quantify uh, the number of cytotoxic cells, of which CTLs, the cytotoxic T cells, are, are one of a couple of different ones. And you can see <clears throat> across all these different cancers that that cytolytic activity is quite variable. Uh, there are many uh, different levels. Even if you look at, let's say, the top kidney clear cell cancer, <clears throat> there are 519 samples there. And you can see there's quite a variation in the amount of cytolytic activity per patient tumor. You can see some tumors, like glioma at the bottom, have very few uh, cytolytic activity, uh, cells with cytolytic activity. But glioblastoma, a more advanced form of glioma, has a lot more. You can see that melanoma, <clears throat> compared to normal skin, has a very large number of cytolytic uh, cells, and that's consistent with the new therapies, anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, which when, when given to patients, a good percentage of melanoma patients will respond quite strongly with an immune response. And the reason is that it already is there, and those um, medicines that have recently been approved release those T cells to start to uh, kill the, the tumor. So you can see there's a lot of variation between individuals, between tumor types, between uh, different phases of tumor, uh, stages of tumor. And then uh, we want to ask what accounts for this variability. 
And I should just say quickly that the cytolytic activity is a predictor of survival in the TCGA data set, especially if you divide it by the number of macrophages, which I won't explain why that particularly works well, but they work in opposite directions. <clears throat> so, um, so what we want to ask, can you go one back? Somehow it's went two ahead. Thank you. So the first question we want to ask is, what are the drivers of immune cytolytic activity? And we considered three potential drivers, neoantigens, viral antigens, and CG antigens. There are different antigens, meaning targets, in the tumors that may drive the T-cell response. And we wanted to ask, can we find a relationship between these different types of antigens being present in the tumor and the amount of cytolytic activity? <clears throat> so the way it works is that proteins that are made in the tumor cell are processed into small peptides, which are then presented on the surface of a cell. And then the T cell may recognize it if it has the right sequence on the T cell receptor. And so we want to know whether neoantigens, that is mutated antigens, that is peptides with mutations in them compared to the normal wild type uh, peptides, might be the source of stimulation for immune responses. And so we basically uh, devised a method to uh, predict uh, neoantigens uh, that would bind to these surface proteins that uh, present them. And we saw a very nice correlation, actually, between the number of neoantigens on the x-axis and cytolytic activity on the y-axis on a tumor-by-tumor -tumor basis. But this was just a correlation. And as geneticists, we always ask, can we find evidence for selection pressure? So if these neoantigens really are driving the immune response, as you can imagine, the immune response would then be able to delete cells that contain these new antigens. So we, again, took a big data approach looking all across many, many thousands of tumors and asked, do we have fewer new antigens than we would expect by chance based on the silent mutation rate? And the silent mutation rate shouldn't have anything selecting against that. And so we can predict the number of new antigens a tumor should have based on silent mutation rate. And then we ask, does it actually have that many? And what you find, for example, is a colorectal cancer has half the neoantigens that we would expect based on the silent mutation rate. But amazingly, if we then uh, shuffle these surface proteins that present, they're called HLA proteins, that present these antigens, if we shuffle them so the tumors have the wrong ones and we re-predict the neoantigens, we don't get a depletion anymore. So it's an HLA-specific um, depletion of neoantigens. So telling, and the HLA is the mechanism by which these antigens are presented to T cells. So this tells you that the T cells are negatively selecting these neoantigens, and therefore the neoantigens really are uh, targets of the immune response. And so this is using big data to really test a very uh, deep and interesting biological hypothesis and coming to uh, uh, genetic selection data, which is ultimately what uh, geneticists consider the, the best evidence for uh, the function of a process or a gene, in this case, a type of gene, a neoantigen. We also looked at other types of antigens to see if they're driving it, and they, they don't. These cancer germline antigens that are re-expressed, I won't go through it. Viral infections, there are certain viruses such as EBV and HPV, which are associated with higher cytolytic activity in tumors that have them. And endogenous retroviruses, which are often ignored, uh, in the red are examples of endogenous retroviruses that are positively correlated with the cytolytic activity in those particular tumors. So we believe there are actually tumor-specific endogenous retroviruses that live in your body that are stimulating these uh, responses. So going on to the second part, we want to look if see if there are resistors of immune activity. So if there is activity, do tumors come up with solutions to avoid being killed by the immune system? And so there what we did is we took the this type of immune analysis that I just showed you, and kind of intersected it with the driver genes, the recurrent genes that are found mutated in tumors, and asked, are there any that are enriched in high tumors with high cytolytic activity versus low? Um, and we did that through a correlation method. I won't show that. And we found, in fact, that the HLA genes, the ones that present the antigen to the T cells, are the most likely to be mutated when you have high cytolytic activity in a tumor. So it's a way for the tumor to escape uh, from, the, uh, from the T cells. Beta-2M is a cofactor for HLA, also a hit. Caspase-8 involved in the death of the tumor cell, also a hit. And about 30 other genes that we know a lot less about. So tumors have lots of tricks to avoid the immune system. Uh, we also looked for amplifications and deletions in genes that would uh, 
be associated with this uh, tumor activity, and discovered, for example, PDL1-2 is one of the top hits. PDL1-2 is the target, in fact, of the uh, major uh, uh, mechanism that is used for therapy from uh, Genentech, uh, as well as from BMS and Merck and so forth. This is the main uh, target. But we found many others, including a new pathway uh, in the ALAX genes, which has never been targeted for this purpose and probably is a good target because the tumors have chosen to uh, change their genetics of those in order to uh, deal with the satellitic activity. So I won't uh, tell you the conclusions and move on to the uh, second part of the uh, talk, which is um, not there. <laughs> Can you go back? There should be something after this one. Yeah, I think uh, the wrong talk was put on. Oh, there we go. No? Oh, yeah, that's good. Yep. So the second part of the talk is uh, just one minute, which is really to tell you that one of the goals we have is to reconstruct circuits. And this are, these are different stories that we've published over the years. And this is together with my close collaborator, Aviv Regev, uh, our labs are next door to each other at the Broad Institute, where we try to reconstruct essentially a single network, which is dendritic cell networks. These dendritic cells are involved in sensing pathogens, viruses and bacteria. And what we're trying to do is understand as much as possible the full pathway, all the regulatory steps in the pathway, and ultimately to be able to write equations that describe uh, this entire process. And so this is just some of the uh, work we've done over the years, and we're continuing to do this pretty intensively. But in addition to trying to reconstruct the network and trying to understand it as deeply as possible, we've also started to look. Uh, it didn't work. Can you go back one? There we go. We've also looked at individuals and asked, are these circuits different? So do, you, do each of us sense viruses and bacteria slightly differently? And the answer is yes. Uh, if we take dendritic cells out of you, we've done this study with 600 people and ask, are there differences in the innate responses to those? There are differences. So we really want to try to understand not only the circuit in the sense of the entire circuit and how it works, but also how does it differ from person to person? How can you explain those differences genetically? And, um, and ultimately, what's the goal of that? Well, the goal is really to get a model and then be able to say, given the genotype of an individual who walks in, can I tweak that model to say the response is going to be different? I don't want to measure the entire response in every person. That's, that's for the studies right now until we understand it. But we want to be able to link the genetics with the actual capabilities quantitatively of different people's responses to viruses, bacteria, and any other immune responses. And if you can understand that kind of variation, you can then look in diseases and say, aha, this is what's happening in that disease. That's where the black box comes in. So if we can open up the black box, you have genetic variants associated with the disease, but what's happening in between? And the study that uh, we did in the 600 people actually started to break open that box and say, what are the actual functional differences resulting from these genetic variant differences? And then by using that information, we hope that the medicine of the future can be a lot more subtle. So despite the idea that we like that, well, here's a gene, let's try to solve the disease with that gene, that just hasn't been how it worked, typically. What we probably need to do is to touch upon many different parts of the system, but in a way that depends on the data of that individual, which is obviously pretty futuristic. And so just like a DJ will you know, change every parameter to make the music sound good, we really need, ultimately, a medicine that is more uh, like that than the current one we have, but we have what we have, it's better than what we had 100 years ago. So we'll, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep improving that. But we need those quantitative models, ultimately, and the relationship between the genetics and the alleles and the quantitative models to really get to a point where we can uh, truly uh, make a model that we can act on in a rational way. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, Mike, Michael Rooney in my lab, a graduate student who did the uh, tumor immunity work and uh, Aviv Regev, who's been a close collaborator on the dendritic cell innate immunity reconstruction uh, for many years. Thanks.